G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is former Special Forces Second Commando Regiment Electronic Warfare Operator, Team Leader Corporal Andy Fermo. Andy has joined us today to talk about his career in the ADF and he will also be talking about his life after service. Hi Andy, thanks for joining us on the show. Oh, hi Adam, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to, to share my story today and being on your podcast. It's an absolute honour and a privilege to have you on the show. So Andy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself as a young fella? Where did you grow up? Do you have any brothers and sisters? And what were you like at school and what were your interests and hobbies growing up? Yeah, yeah. As, as a young fellow, we, we, we migrated here in, in 1983, so I think I was only about three years old at the time or something, well, thereabouts, you know, and uh, we, we came to Perth. So we're um, from uh, WA in Perth originally. And, uh, but my dad, we, uh, we migrated here and my dad was in the mining game. So as, uh, as, a, as a child, we actually grew up in mining towns in, in WA in the Northern Territory. So outback uh, remote mining towns, uh, small with small schools where we had to, to make our own fun and, and uh, get a bit of larrikinism up there and, uh, and, and just hook in as a, as a young, you know, sort of a Asian family as well. Uh, there was times when, um, you know, we were, we were outsiders looking in a predominantly white Australia, uh, time you know in in, in the 80s but um i you know had, had a great uh childhood i'm fortunate to say that you know my, my parents are still together now and uh and uh, they have a strong relationship and and when we we're growing up you know i had a, had a loving family and we've got two i've got a brother and a sister as well so i'm the eldest of three and uh but we grew up in mining town so i think we needed to this is where uh, that that importance of immediate support comes in because you know as a as a migrant family uh, to Australia we didn't have immediate support of grandparents or any other families we we're first generation there and well you know I wasn't born in Australia but uh, all, all my whole life we've been here and um, so that's where we, we formed that tight bond and uh, so I grew up in you know remote outback towns uh, one of the ones where I actually recently got to to revisit was uh, Jabiru uh, in, in the Kakadu National Park. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, sort of really great spiritual connection there to country and, and, and the Indigenous um, people talk, you know, First Nations peoples talk about uh, connection to country. And, and that was a really big one there for us during our tour amongst all the great spots. But, yeah, so that's that's where we grew up in mining towns. But they uh, decided to... We, we, my parents came back to Perth uh, just as I was about to start high school. So um, you know, we made our own fun out in the in the country, and uh, and that was really great, a really great upbringing to be able to um, not be so reliant on so many things and so many services. And you know, that's where my love for the bush really come in you know and, and being in the outdoors I'm, a, I'm an outdoors person uh, I love that I love my tech but that's where I think that part really and, and the Mr Captain Adventure type thing came in because you had to make your own fun you had to do things out the bush to to get by you know and then it's and it is difficult living in remote spots so you have to be resilient in that way but when we came to uh to Perth that was the start of the, the FIFO and, and, and as, as good as FIFO is, you know, when I uh, was in my teenage years in high school, um, that's probably one of the things, you know, that I talk to dad about now is that I lost uh, my, 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 uh, my father figure, you know, my male role model for, half, for, for pretty much, you know, it would have been over half the time because then the swings were really big. So the advantage of FIFO, um, and I only really see that now as, as, as an adult, you know, there's sacrifices that need to be made for a family unit, but, and, you know, and as a father and, and all that sort of thing. And, and, but at the same time, uh, uh, growing up, as a teenager, I lost a, a lot of that. So we run them up, 
quite quite a fair bit, and, and we were quite a handful for for mum and for for mum uh, who was looking after us and keeping a job. But you know, there was lots of travel, and we also had to be, take a lot of responsibility as well as that. What you did in, in the nineties there to to be able to um you know help out, and we were so like, and then you know mum's coming back from work, and so that was all the things. But uh, one of the one of the things that I did as as a, as a young teenager anyway was that Captain Adventure was, oh, okay, well, what activities can I do? And this is before I found parties and girls, you know, and then the lure of music and all that type of thing. But when I was a young teenager, I wanted to, to uh, be adventurous. And, and so I joined the Army Cadets. And that was part of the school that I actually went to in, in high school. And um, so I joined up with that, you know, and learned the map. It was really cool stuff. And like young teenagers, they said, oh, you get to go on a camp a couple of times a year. You get to bloody shoot, shoot a gun. You might be able to do some ad sailing. I'm like, sign me up, you know. And so that was what I really enjoyed doing um, as, as a hobby, uh, as one of the hobbies anyway. I always loved being near the water as well. So, um, you know, uh, love going down to the beach and bodyboarding and, and swimming um lucky person not really got big surf but you know i love going down to the beach and we'd always sort of go down there all the time so that was where the love for the for the water and getting into that nature you know nature in all sort of aspects of the water the bush um is what i really enjoyed um yeah and so but it wasn't until i sort of discovered parties and girls and you know and, and, and wanting to be with my peer group you know and my mates that um you know, I kind of fell off the axis there a little bit, and and uh, so cadets was turfed for in 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 light of that, and uh, that's where I think that rolled on to the to you know post high school, and then I was partying too much, and and you know uh, do, doing a few things that I shouldn't have been doing uh, as as a young adult, and um, yeah, that's that was my upbringing. <laughs> So you talk about army cadets, you talk about partying and being a young adult, which we've all we've all been there, Andy. We've all, you know, we've all gone out and partied early and hard in our in our early twenties. Yeah. And so what was it that made you come to the decision to join the regular army in two thousand? Yeah, great question, mate. And then that's where I think, you know, I, I kind of was a bit off the rails with uh with enjoying life too much and and, and that sort of uh, party scene you know I'd um, finished finished my high school and then I'd gotten a, a pretty good job but and I was in a pretty good peer group but I also got some work uh, some bar work and that's you know uh, and that was kind of party central Perth uh, in the late 90s we had a massive scene that I was right into the band scene and I was just getting into my music because I, I played guitar as well and that was you know right into that scene and, and I got a job um, at the Dina at Aberdeen Hotel. That was one of the biggest hotels in Northbridge at the time. And so that was just the, the lifestyle that we were leading. And, um, you know, the school that I went to was quite a, quite a rough school. So they kind of also knew a few, you know, but they had some amazing friends there. But I think that that lifestyle and that setting uh, for me, in, in a nice way without incriminating myself too much, is just that, yeah, I was partying too much. And there came to be an epiphany where well, my younger brother, he was also, uh, he did cadets and then um, joined as a chocker, as a, as a reservist. And anyway, he was over in Melbourne and he just joined and, and changed over to be full-time. And uh, there had to be sort of a bit of an intervention there in, in lifestyle choices with a couple of different people coming in and, um, you know, sort of I was a bit off the rails and, and uh, my brother flew back and, you know, it was one of those ones where I knew that I needed to do something else after this intervention and, and um, there had to be decisions to be made and I think that was one of the first most pivotal decision points that needed to be made for me to, to move forward is either continue on this track or I can go and dissociate myself and actually go on down a different path that's going to be better for me and, and my own well-being and, and my career. So I chose to, uh, you know, I said, well, boy, you know, always loved the army or join, you know, and I thought, okay, 
no worries. Well, I'll give that a shot. But at the same time, coming from, uh, you know, with, with uh, my uh, my Asian heritage with mum and dad, like it was always, ah, oh, you need to be, you need to be a, an accountant. You need to be a doctor or this one here. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not really a, I'm not really an academic dude. I'm, I'm not like the uni type of person. I like the outdoors. I like more vocational stuff. But I also had that in mind that I needed, you know, um, with my brother being in the army and, and uh, okay, well, what job could I do? And so I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll appease the oldies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sign up on the dotted line as well as a choco, as a reserve. Sorry, I won't use choco. I would use reservist as, as a reservist. I'll, I'll, I'll sign up, and I signed up as a as a, a geek, or, so as a systems guy, because I thought oh, I'll get a bit of a trade there and I'll do computers, you know, computer networking. <laughs> so that was how I actually signed up as a, as a reservist doing that skill. So it was still in signals because my brother was in, um, in signals as well. And I thought, well, that's my foot in the door uh, to get in. Like, you know, I, I, I really would have liked to also join the infantry or, or a corps, an arms corps. But I thought, look, you know, if I'm going to be respectful as well to, to the oldies, I'll uh, try and get a trade in that way and then I can always manoeuvre around down the track. That was my joining into the military. <laughs> so so you mentioned, Andy, that you your brother, you know, he was in the army. And, but did you have anyone else, any other family members that had served or were you and your brother the, the first to serve in your family? Uh, I think... I think we might have had some some family members, uh, you know, back in the Philippines that might have been in the military. Uh, I'm not quite too sure about that. You know, might have been more towards that sort of World War II roots. Um, but as far as the, our immediate family, yes. So my brother and I, uh, but, you know, are, are veterans as well. So, but yeah, I signed up as a as a geek and uh, and then changed over to be a different trade. Yeah, so you you actually, yeah, how did you find yourself in the role of an electronic warfare operator and what were you doing? What was the role? What did it entail? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great question. Is that, so as a, how, when I was at recruit, or at, at WAGA, you know, I was at um, the recruiting there during my 12 weeks or whatever it was at the time. And, and uh, as I, as the weeks were rolling on, I just really loved being, immersed in that lifestyle again you know like when you sort of start there's kind of three phases to the training where they at first you, you do things because you you're scared of the repercussions and then as you get to know your, your team and and the people in the platoon and then you start to get that sense of of, of you know uh, self-worth and, and confidence you, you're kind of doing things halfway uh because you want to and then but you're also still scared of the repercussions and then as you get to the sort of tail end you're wanting to do it because, you know, you form those bonds and you, they sort of change it to be, you know, the basic uh, military soldier, you know, at, at the basic level and you're wanting to do it. Now, at some point during that time, I'm like, well, I fucking love this too much. You know, this is awesome. And, and why don't I join on to be a full time? And so, you know, a few of the boys, the majority of the fellas at the time were, you um, we're going to be full time at them, and so I thought, well, well, let's see what's going on. So I asked, uh, you know, I remember his name was Bombardier Jewel. He's one of the other secos. I said, uh, um, you know, what are, what other jobs are there? And he goes, well, you can do these ones. I said, well, what about if I keep in SIGs just to to uh, you know, still mindful of that thing in the background? Then I'm like, okay, well, what can I do if I wanted to go full time? He goes, well, what do you want to do, Holmes? And I said, I want to shoot guns. I want to be outdoors, but if there's some tech involved as well, let's, you know, that's going to be doing that. And he goes, oh, well, I've worked, you know, and then this is the same with my sector as well. He's like, oh, well, why don't you do, and I think it might have been part of the recruiting drive, but he said, oh, it involves something where you can't tell other people. I said, well, what that? He goes, well, it involves a top secret clearance, you know, and you get to do some of the really cool stuff. You get to shoot guns, but then you get to play with tech. The guys don't talk about it. We don't know about it too much. But this secret clearance is really cool and, and you might be able to get a jump out of a plane. I went, oh, sign me up. Oh, you had me at top secret clearance. What's this? You know, I'll be like a 007 or something, you know, and I thought, okay, you know. <laughs> I think back on it now and went, okay, I didn't even without. And then he goes, well, I said, what's that job? And he goes, it's EW, Electronic Warfare. And I'm like, oh, 
well, that sounds pretty cool as well. So it's electronic and warfare and, you know, uh, little did I know at the time it was a little bit different to what I would have been expected, but I ended up really loving doing that role. You know, it was, it was awesome. So how old were you, Andy, when you, like, at what age were you when going through basic training? And then I can I can sort of imagine early 20s, you know, being, oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll jump in without really knowing what's behind the role. But, yeah, like, how old were you? Oh, I think it would have been maybe 21 or 22. So I didn't join straight off the bat. You know, uh, that, that was the that whole bit couple of years beforehand got yep. a couple of years of, of ground you know real world experience living out of home and 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 learning how to do it the hard yards and so for me that wasn't a, a thing but yeah so I was I was 20 22 I think at the time so still in my early 20s wanting to party but I I knew that 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 was the lifestyle that was going to be for me um as an EW operator and and I think you know when they finally explained it to me is it was basically um you know we were force multipliers and uh to put it in the way that some of the other audiences is basically it's a glorified eavesdropper um you intercept enemy communications and uh and you uh you, you get the gisting of what's going on and you also have specialist equipment which to to geolocate or triangulate uh, enemy positions and uh, you report it to a higher authority um, and, and the commander or even if it's that's tactical and they use that as part of the intelligence piece to be able to then maneuver uh, maneuver the chess pieces across the board on what they're doing you know uh, using using that part of um, that intelligence picture that we're providing. So after you signed on the dotted line for an EW operator, did you have to go and do specialist training after Kapuka? Like what, what was involved in that? Yeah, so you, you go to, um, we went to Watsonia, so near, near Green, in, in Melbourne, to do the basic signaler training. So you, you, you do your basic signals training uh, there for, I think it was six or eight months, and then you learn how to use radios and, and all those other things that are, basic in the in signals core and then from there you actually get shipped out to to Wumbo Kabbalah in the southeast Queensland where the Darling Downs is to be able to do then do your uh, it's an outpost of the defense force school of signals where they train you in your in your specialist trade of EW and then you you did that and where was your first posting Andy yeah, um, the first uh, posting that I had was at 7C. So 7 Signal Regiment uh, is the, uh, the, the army, uh, the army um, wing of, of electronic warfare. So with electronic warfare, it's a, it's a tri-service environment. And then there's sort of, there's a couple of different levels of it. So one could be the, the strategic level where a lot of guys went down to Canberra and that's more like your office job type, type uh, of uh, environment. But for me... I always have been from the outset, yeah, I want to be, you know, I want to be carrying the packs or in the vehicle or, or doing that stuff with the guns and, you know, we might get the free ride in the chopper one day and all that. So I got posted to 7 I was really quite vocal about what I wanted to do from the outset. I wanted to do the man pack role. I wanted to work with, there was some really exciting stuff going on at the time. Uh, with uh, with three RER and the infantry units and and so that was exciting for me and and I was lucky enough to be to, to be posted to Seven C and uh, you know it was around about that time as well it was where Timor was in, in full flight as well it was kind of starting to be towards the tail end of Timor but there was um, some exciting opportunities uh, at that unit at the time so that was the first posting for me. So how long were you at that posting before you decided to make the change to Special Forces and what made you want to change to Special Forces? Well, I always enjoyed the, the man pack role within EW because it had that element of, um, of, of doing the, you know, the army, the war fighting and it was small units. You know, one of the first places that we went to was to, to um, the Pilbara Regiment to learn their patrolman's course because they were doing some really awesome stuff, you know, in defense of the, you know, the country. And um, so we, that really sort of opened my eyes to being able to want to do some, 
things with you know with the infantry units um like with with three rar at the time and uh we, it had been a while since our capability had been uh embedded within other units so there was there was a, a, already a detachment in perth at the time with the sas and then there was a an upcoming a pending capability to be formed as part of Sydney. And this is when we were still, uh, you know, at, in Kabbalah and, and I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'll put my hand up for either one of the postings. That seems pretty good because it's special forces. And, you know, I didn't really know too much about the special forces at the time. I'm like, I knew that they were elite. And um, so w when I actually got posted to Sydney, it was a couple of years where, they were still re-rolling. It was it was for RAR at the time, and they were re-rolling that unit from an infantry battalion to the special forces, you know, commando unit. So that was still happening. And then concurrently, when I was still at at, at five four seven troop in in uh, Kabbalah, uh, they said, "Okay, we're going to post you to Sydney, but that's not ready yet." So uh, for for two years on two posting cycles, there was a couple of the boys that got posted to Perth, and I'm like, "Ah." Oh, I get to post. I get to go home to Perth. I'm going to Perth. I'm going to Perth. I'm going to Perth. Back home, dream posting because it's quite difficult to get posted there. And I uh, work my ass off to, um, you know, yeah, I'm going to be fit. I'm going to be working with these dudes, you know, because there was a that was the the sentiment, you know, you got to you got to be able to fit in and keep up. So and and being in our role with Manpack, you had to you had to be doing so. I, I was loving the the military lifestyle. But then the year that we were posted, and this is at the end of 2005, they finally said, oh, yeah, no, Sydney's standing up. I was like, oh, okay, uh, okay, uh, all right, okay, I'm not going home to Perth. And so that was essentially, Adam, and this is, I was still a, a black hat at the time, so I wasn't qualified. Um, and we got posted to Sydney as part of, uh, you know, it was one of five dudes to, to get posted there with the troop to help stand up this capability. And, um, you know, when we got posted down there, I arrived, you know, I drove with uh, dad across from Perth in, in my car and I rocked up. Uh, within, within two weeks, basically, uh, it was the first time that, that the Tag East had had a role in a, like the, the, the lead role in a, in a counter-terrorism, which was the 2006 Commonwealth Games, you know? So there I was as a kind of a, as, as a billy lid in terms of, being exposed to that environment and we're in melbourne and all i can just remember was just some all the, the training and the markup training and you know all the stuff was in the warehouse <clears throat> and uh and then we were doing these full mission what they call full mission profiles and uh we're in in different locations and all i just remember one night where you know the helicopter was coming down and I could see the guys yeah, I saw the helicopter flare up and I could see the guys fast roping down and the bang 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 and I'm like oh this is sweet you know we were in this other area where, where the comms the comms area was you know the soft sea they call it and it was the comms area but we could see these other things going on I'm like, wow this is this is what I joined up for you know the guns you know we get to do this and um so after that full mission profile I think it must have been about you know you know, midnight or that was there was a bit of a lull in what they were doing I said to my boss I said how, how, how do I do that how do I get into that you know and and um he said well the firm says there's two types there's cat a where you become a shooter if you get qualified or there's cat b and you can retain your role be qualified because that's what I've noticed a few of the guys in in the unit uh, at 126 had green you know the beret and I'm like oh, how do I get one of those you know, and, and they said, well, you got to earn it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, well, what do I do? And he said, well, there's cat A, there's cat B, and you just need to sign up on, on the, the network. So I got in at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock or whatever time it was early in the morning, red-eyed, you know, bleary-eyed, went and, and signed on and, and then um, filled in my paperwork to, to apply for the barrier testing. So it wasn't even to get in. It was just for the aptitude and barrier testing. And, um, you know, we were speaking earlier on in the calls about different, uh, you know, people saying you can't do this, you can't do that, but overcoming it. 
And in EW, sometimes for certain languages, there was a, a certain aptitude, you know, and they said, oh, you couldn't even speak English. And I go, well, I'm speaking, I'm speaking, you know, not the Queen's English, but I'm speaking English and I could learn different languages like what you can learn uh, as you would in EW. So I'm trainable, but, um, you know, sometimes uh, I have to do some of the psych stuff to get in and, you know, there's a quite a rigorous process. So I signed up for that and then passed all the, the testing. And then I was quite fortunate that, uh, you know, we were with the you know, at two commando at, at four AI commando then. And uh, I got speaking to some of the shooters and some of the guys that were qualified and they were just amazing in giving me the guidance that I needed because I could see that I was keen to be able to go for, for, for barrier testing. And, and it's not like they're giving you any special treatment. They just go, okay, this is what you need to do. They, that's the way you need to go, go and do it. You know, then you've got to actually want to find your own resources and be resourceful to be able to find out what you actually need to do. They'll guide you on the path. Go, oh, that's a direction. You're going in the right direction, but you actually need to go and seek it out yourself. You know, you need to train, you need to speak to people and in, in the, in the men, both the mental and physical preparation. So, you know, um, that was my choice in going in. And, and I think at the time, that's the reason as well is, is dealing with the cards that I was dealt and, 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 and going, let's not hire that. Oh, I didn't get posted to Perth or I didn't, you know, I got posted to Sydney instead was making the most out of that opportunity and going, well, this is, this is a unit that's here. Um, they're, they're, they're at, an, at an elite level. I can see that with my own eyes and I want to be part of that community. Um, one, because, you know, we were a new capability in at that time but also uh i wanted i didn't want to just sort of ride on the coattails of being attached which is you, you know there were some there was some sentiments of people being posted into the unit and go oh i'm a special forces operator and all within that environment and, and i go well i need to actually earn my place to be able to get the respect of my peers uh in that unit as well as going you know we're a new capability let's let's you know, and that was my mindset, Adam, to, to really get in and, and do that and, and, and do the best I can. So d- during your selection course, Andy, what, what was the hardest aspect for you? What did you find the toughest during your and through recycle and all that sort of stuff? What was the hardest part of your course? I think some of the one of the hardest parts there was, you know, I think that, you know, I'm a vertically challenged. I'm not that tall a dude. So um when I rocked up to, like, say, the barrier testing, and I passed the barrier testing, but when I rocked up to, to selection, I was one of the shortest dudes there. You know, everyone was, like, six foot tall, big dudes, you know, like, worked out. And so I wasn't the the biggest. Oh, well, I'll backtrack a sec. So I think that one of, one of the challenges that I had was, I suppose, I'm not physically massive. But that doesn't hold you back from being able to do something. So it was it was challenging. It was difficult. But like we spoke about before the call, is not I can't do that. So I really wanted to do that um, to be, become qualified, and and that was part of it. You know, I needed to prove it. So I wasn't going to let the physical or the you know the height or the strength um, slow me down from being able to 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 have a red hot crack at the role. And um, I think that's one. But I think also. It tests your it tests your, uh, your your mental fortitude as well, Adam. You know, so when you when you're doing some of the um, the selection training, I, I think it's just also that curve because I I came from a, a signals background or a non arms core background. I had to rapidly learn how the guys, you know, from an infantry unit or from a, a, you know, a a, a mechanized unit performed and then really be quick in in the uptake to learn those skills to be able to one, keep up, but to learn them and to, to, you know, uh, to keep up and also really excel in them to be selected as as, as someone that can be trainable and and, and display those commando traits during um, the, the selection process. So I think, you know, that that was a difficulty there, but um, something that I overcame because I really wanted it bad. Yeah. So 
What advice, Andy, would you give to any young digger looking to do selection for special forces? Yeah, I think there's 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 a there's a couple of little things, you know. Um, the special forces, as 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 a it's an it's an elite organisation with with some really amazing people, great leadership and opportunities to come in there. Like it will take you to that pinnacle of what you're wanting to do if that's the way you want to go. But sometimes as well, we need to have, um, you know, for, if you're a young fella that's wanting to get in and you're just 17, sometimes you might be able to match up physically or, or, or train that way, but you also need the ground and the maturity to have a, a little bit behind you. So uh, to, to be able to get that mental fortitude in and get in and not saying that people haven't at that younger stage, I've been out for a while now. So, but I think that having that little bit of uh, life experience and that maturity can go in. So if you have a crack and they say, come back, just bloody come back and, and give it another shot, you know? So that's that's one of the things. And also is not letting, you know, things like if you're, if you're, if you're short or doing these and not letting that stop you from having a go as well. Because, you know, even I'll be sure there's, there's shorter dudes in, in, in the organisation that just kicked ass in what they did, you know? Um, they didn't let that stop to be out. So I think that, when people say that you can't, we never amount to anything. Is just have a go anyway. Because I think the, the 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 thing that you can do is only you, you can get said no to, but you had a crack, and then that way, if you know that you had a hundred percent, hundred and ten percent crack, knowing that you did the training, you prepared yourself mentally, you knew what you were getting you're getting into, and then having a go. That's one of the big things, you know. Um, and doing your research beforehand is, is a, you know, prior preparation and planning prevents piss poor performance is just doing your research about, you know, what, is, what are the traits they're looking for? And I suppose um, the last one as well is just to play the game. You know, if you're doing your selection and you're being beasted and they will beast you, I'm not, I'm, it's a fucking hard course. That's what it's meant to do. It's meant to break you down and test all aspects of your physically and mentally, it's meant to break you down. And they're not meant to be your mates. They're meant to be assessing you to see whether you're suitable for further training before they even say you're going to be in. So, you know, just play the bloody game. If they're telling you to do something, you know, just bloody do it. You know, it's as easy as that. And, and, uh, and, and just one day at a time, one minute at a time, you know, like you go... The course is this long. How am I going to get there? And then it's just like, okay, one day at a time. And this is from a personal just point of view. But then also is also learning how to get on with your, with your teammates, you know, all your other candidates playing that game. How, how can we get here? What, what's the expectation of me and the team as well? How am I going to be performing, you know? Uh, am I going to be the grey man or am I going to be the Mr. Know-it-all or, or, or whatever it is? is learning, you know, um, how to make friends and influence people. I think there's a, there's a self-help book on that. But that's, that's one of the things in being able to be a well-rounded person as a, as a candidate that's going to be, you know, highly sought after anyway. So what did it mean and what does it still mean to you to be a Green Beret qualified commando? What does it mean to you now, Andy? Oh, yeah, it still means the world to me. You know, um, I think that that's a, a part of, of, of knowing who I am and, and where I've been. Um, uh, you know, I think I, I'm proud to, to, to call myself amongst a group of, of, of amazing people that have earned the right to be able to, to don the, the Sherwood Green Beret, you know. So uh, I think that that's really important, but on a personal level as well, it, it, it is a pivotal point where, you know, I achieved something that uh, I really wanted to strive towards. I, I worked towards it and it was a, a pinnacle of, for me, a, a pinnacle point in my career to, have, to achieve that level and then go further, be selected further for the training. So I think that's, you know, the statistics around being able to become qualified is one thing and, and a massive personal achievement but also a professional achievement as well. And then you become, you, you, you know, you, you're one of the brotherhood of people that you can just go in and, and speak to different people and you know exactly what it is that you've been through, whether it's a dude that was in Vietnam that was spoken to or even, you know, some of the older dudes to the guys that are current now, 
you know, the, the mindset's a bit different and, you know, um, depending on, on where people are in their, their journey. But it is a, it's a brotherhood of people that uh, I, I really feel privileged to be among, yeah. I recently had Commando Nick Hill on and he, 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 had a, he said it to me and, and it made a lot of sense, Andy, that he said it's harder to keep your beret than it is to earn it. And, you know, and that's because he said you've always got, there's so much rotation going through through the company and through the regiment that he said it's harder to, to, to keep your beret than it is to earn it because you've got so many people that want to be part of the special forces. And, and mate, it's exactly talking to you then i can see like i can see you and mate there's a, there's a smile on your face when you you know you talk about your green beret that's you know it's something that you've earned and you're at the pinnacle of you know you're at the, you know and, and like you said mate it, it's something that you set out for that you set a goal you you know you had the positive mindset and you've and you achieved that goal and, and i think that's the message mate that you know we were talking beforehand that myself personally I'm now got a positive mindset and, you know, I've changed and it's amazing that when you think positively so much changes in your life and, you know, great things happen. And, and I made it for you. Absolutely. Earning that beret was the positive yeah. mindset and, and achieving that goal and, and having a purpose, mate, absolutely. Well done to you, you know, well done. Thank you so much. And I, I, and I totally agree with, with uh, what, what Nick's sentiments were to be able to, it is harder to keep your beret. They, they, you're, you know, once you're in, it's it's about you know uh, perfection. To me, is a word that's a little bit harder. I think I, I like to be able to say it in more of the constant pursuit of excellence, right? So once you're in, there's that mentality. You you got to be you got to be better. You know, how do we do this in a better way? And I think that that's the whole thing about the rivalry is making sure that you could you got to be at the to be at the elite level. You have to keep pushing yourself. And then, you know, you can't just rest on those laurels and go, oh, yeah, I'm here now, so I'm just going to uh, – I think that in, in that mindset anyway. So to have that longevity um, and, and, and to, to be uh, still respected within the unit for a long time, I really tip my hat to the guys that, that have been in for, for, for so long, you know, that are that life there. And, and, but I think in that, in that type of organisation, people stay in for a, as long as they can anyway. Well, I've I read somewhere, Andy, that a commando is like the equivalent of a elite athlete, like Olympic standard, and and you know you you got to have physical, like you, you know your, your physical fitness, you've got to be elite, like it's got to be at the elite level. It's it's you know like intellectually, you know you're you're making decisions that are with no sleep. You're hungry, like you know th these are things that like mate we we do put you like commandos and sas guys as you know the elite the pinnacle because you know it's it's like you're not human in what you're doing you know like it's it, it, in from from a civilian's point of view like that's that's what it looks like mate and you've been there you've lived it tell me what you know what are your thoughts on that uh well look i, I think that you know where we where as a person who was who was qualified so i was a cat b i, I retained my original trade. So if I just digress from that question for a moment. Yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, having been commando qualified, I, I got to, as a cat B for me at the time, was to be able to also, that was a bit of a recruiting decision for me to, to keep dudes coming in from our trade to go, hey, look, this if you want to be here you and be part of this unit, and the expectation off the bat, because we were the first people there, is to be able to try and ultimately get qualified as well. And, and, and that was a, um, that was a, a stream at the time to stay within the command and then i also got to be able to do the really cool stuff as as uh you know with, with the, the 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 companies as and when they it was needed and i got to do some really cool stuff like you know whenever they needed someone extra on a team you know or, or with the training so that was really cool to be able to do that but um as as a person oh, hold on so hold on can you ask <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, no it, it pretty much was just basically commando being at an olympic standard like at, at the elite level yeah okay so absolutely you know i think to to be constantly uh on the hunt for for improvement is a big one and it's also part of the job you know you're, you're at a, an elite unit so you know you've got to do things to be able to go in and if you're being paid to keep fit well you bloody you you keep fit, you know, and you do extracurricular things to be able to, um, to to build on your skill sets, whether it's in your own time or or some of the. There's heaps of stuff and 
heaps of capabilities within the unit and opportunities that come up um, that you go for those things. And I think that that's a big thing is that constant pursuit of being able to better yourself um, in, in, in many aspects of your life as well. But, you know, more commonly as a soldier and then also as a, as a, a person that's, a, you know, part of a team and a, and a wider organisation. So you mentioned that you you went Cat B again, and so once you obviously got your your beret and you you were posted to the Second Commando Regiment, what where did you get posted to, and and who were who were some of the the soldiers and NCOs that you looked up to once you were in the unit? Yeah, okay, look, great question. So you know, uh, I looked to a lot of the uh, I was posted to one two six Signal Squadron, so that was the attached. Um, squadron or, or like you know uh, support part of the, the support structure to the to the companies and then what would happen is that they would farm out dudes to be attached and embedded within the company and that was the, what happened at the time when I was there um, so there was a few people at in the companies that I really respected and looked up to as, as peers but you know within 126 uh, signal squadron as well I looked up to the to the guys that were very qualified and remain cat B, um, you know there was so much there was so much knowledge within just the the team leader level and and the and the, and the, the sergeant level to be able to um, you know there was so much knowledge there uh, they were always inspiring me especially as as someone coming in with a new capability it was exciting so. That was my bag uh, and, and, you know, the, the guys that um, within our troop, that was our bag to be able to really develop that capability. And, and so the leadership um, at the time uh, was, was amazing and, and, and the guidance. But more so, though, for that, uh, there was lots of guys within 126 that I really respected, especially at that, that, um, that team level and, and the Bravos at, like, at that level. And even, even as at the officers as well, um, there, there was some really great leadership. But within the companies, just, yeah, just the amount of knowledge and the, the willingness of people to, to be able to, to help you out, you know, um, was, was an amazing thing in the camaraderie. And that's what really inspired me and, and, and uh, during my uh, deployments as well, you really become embedded as part of that company that you're attached to, you know, that's your company. And, um, and from, you know, there, there's some really great leaders within, within that, you know, and uh, in particular, my first, uh, in, in particular, my first uh, deployment, you know, um, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the CSM was uh, one of the guys that I ended up uh, with, with Alpha Company and, and you know, uh, made, uh, is, I think he's uh, Brigadier General Ian Lang, but he was a major at the time, um, brought the, the, the best out of the soldiers, you know, and, uh, and, and everyone would follow him. He, he led by example, was one of the fittest dudes um, in in the, if not the fittest guy in the, the company, you know, like whenever they were testing the blokes for, for you know, to, to keep, retain your beret, he was always the, the you know, he was a wiry dude, Bejo, and um, he kicked everyone's ass. And, and, and that's the type of dude that you, you follow because he had the ability to, to speak on, a, on that really high level, but he never spoke to anyone uh, in, when, when I experienced, you know, like under his command, he never spoke to anyone like he was beneath you. So he always just adjusted the level that he talked. So he got the most out of his soldiers. And, and if there was one person in particular um, that I really admired from, from, from that group, you know, I'll, I'll say that is, yeah, it, it was, was um, yeah, Ian Langford, a major, you know, Brigadier General, now Brigadier General Ian Langford, because that was someone that, you know, everyone really respected and, and as a leader would follow him and do what he said, you know? So I think that that, that display of, of leadership was just uh, amazing. So almost everyone knows where they were when 9-11 happened and how did you learn ab- about the attacks and what were your first thoughts on what effects that would have on, on you and, and what it meant bigger picture for going into Australia's longest war? And did you think that a war was going to happen? Uh, great question. I remember it vividly. I was in Melbourne. Uh, I was at Watsonia Barracks. I think it would have been, it was, it was just, you know, 
maybe early evening or something like that, so preparing to go out for the weekend or, or on one of the nights um, out at Watsonia. And I remember I was talking to the boys in the hall, we're getting ready to go out, and then all of a sudden, you know, the the bloody the duty NCO or the duty sergeant came in and he was like waving his arms about. He's like, whoa, oh, yeah, the Taliban's attacking, you oh, know, the two towers. Oh, sorry, he was like, the two towers, there's an attack. And we're like, what the fuck? What's going on here and so basically uh we were all called into different roles within the the the, the base uh, the safety um category on the base changed and then i was put straight onto the front front gate along with the whole pretty much who was <laughs> there with me at the time get your webbing get your gear on um Cam up again, or like get into your cams and boom, you're on duty. And we were at the front gate, not knowing what was going to happen. And as soon as we walked into that front gate, because then they'd locked them in, and and then there was all this news about, you know, you see those images now of the billowing smoke from the from the from the first tower, and that was only the first attack. Um, you know, and then we were just our eyes were glued to the screen and just in shock. Of, of what was happening, you know, and we were there, we were, you know, there was no rounds or anything like that at the time, but it was like, okay, let's just go in and, you know, get your webbing and we don't know what's going to happen. So that was like, okay, we're on a high alert. And, um, and that was, that's what had happened, you know, the gates were locked and then there was um, from then on in the, that the security was a big thing. And, and I didn't know, I knew that there was going to be some repercussions. And you know, obviously uh, you had Iraq going on. We're like, okay, well, this is a, this theatre of wars. You know? and, and, and I think for me at the time, you know, because I wasn't really a much of a strategist type thing and I was just fresh into the military, I'm like, okay, we might get a go here, you know. Um, team wars off and there's stuff happening. There's team wars happening. There's, uh, the, you know, the Solomons uh, happening. Um, you know, there, there's deployments going around. We're in a we're in the box seat. I don't know what's going to take us, but as a young digger, I knew that there was opportunity that was going to happen at some point. I didn't know when, and 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 I didn't couldn't predict that uh, the year the, the you know that campaign was going to go for so long in the, in the longest history. But what I knew that there was there was going to be some shit happen, and and uh, you know I was excited to to be potentially part of that. You know, as a, as a, as a Billy Lid, you know, I'm like, okay, well, I don't need to wait for so long. Like the stories that we'd heard of of uh, you know uh, that gap between uh, between Vietnam and, uh, and and Timor, essentially. I know there was stuff in between, so no offense to to any of the listeners out there, but I know that you know there's a lot of the speed people that we've spoken to um, at that time that that call those years the nothing years, and you, it wasn't the nothing years, but you know, that's another topic, but that's what that's what was happening at the time, Adam, um, for me, you know, being on the front gate, watching. Well, it was, Andy, it's a period of time where especially you speak to a lot of, and, you know, you've spoken to a lot of veterans, and it was. It was a time of between Vietnam and, and what was happening in East, like, you know, you had Somalia and you had a few other, you know, things happen and going on and Rwanda and a few other, but... It was a time where it was really, it was a quiet, like it was quieter than what had been, you know, had gone on from Vietnam. And, you know, everyone remembers, you know, Andy, where they were when 9-11. And for me, mate, you know, I was, I was eight years old. You know, I remember, you know, I remember getting up as a kid and, mate, I, I thought it was a movie, to be honest. I, you know, I was, I was getting ready for school and, I remember where was Cheese TV? Cheese TV wasn't on and, you know, being, being a kid. And, and I, I, I honestly didn't think it was real. I, I just, you know, I thought, oh, what's what's happened here? And, and you know, being eight, you, you know, you like, I, I've got a thing, you know, I look back now and, you know, I'm 29 and, and I look back at, you know, uh, for me, you know, there's been a lot of life events for a lot of people over the years. And, and for me, it was 9-11, the Bali bombings, the tsunami of 2004 and, and, you know, many other things that have happened. But everyone remembers, like you remember, you know, everyone remembers that day because it, it changed the world and, and it, you know, it was a lot of innocent people died that day and it was... Really, it was a, an attack on the world. It wasn't just America. It was an attack on, on the world and our, and our freedoms, you know, and that's how I see it now. 
looking back, you know, 20 years on. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, you know, it was a big, massive, pivotal event. That life, cha- um, you know, world changing, really. Um, yes. So for you, Andy, like seeing those events unfold, was mm. what was it what was your feeling like of you know like you thought you know it was it was some years before you would be deployed to Afghanistan but what were what were your feelings at the time around the prospect of you actually going into combat yeah it, it, for me it was exciting you know that was the whole that was the whole captain adventure and, and the reason why I signed up to do what, what I wanted to do and you know the reason why I wanted to that I really wanted to be in that sort of role where I was man packing and being on the ground because, you know, um, there could have been at some point, you know, for me to, to, to get a Guernsey and, 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 and do, you know, do my job for real. So that for me, excited me, you know, I mean, obviously there's, there's fears around the what ifs about being deployed and you watch all the movies and, and, you know, I didn't have any real point of reference in terms of, um, you know, sort of immediate family that I know of, like we spoke about earlier on, as to what, you know, there could be atrocities or what the fallout would be. It was more theoretical in 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 that, in, in my way of thinking back then. So it was an adventure for me. Um, you know, I might get a Guernsey and I'll get to do this shit for real. And so that was really exciting uh, with, that, with that prospect. So you mentioned earlier that you were part of the, so you were part of Tag East during the Melbourne Commonwealth Games in 2006. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, oh yeah, it was, yeah, that was uh, the, the best, that was the best selling point, I think, that the uh, that the unit had to be able to recruit, to recruit people, uh, you know, sort of, for me, I think that I, I, I got to really sort of get, a good grounding for what it was like to be in in an elite unit. And, you know, at that time they were still finding what, what they were wanting to do. Like that was their first job on point and to be attached within, uh, you know, one one of the troops to to, to provide that support and be there. I I just thought it was a really a great experience to, to go in and then also see how much work goes into the planning and how many different resources, you know, uh, connecting with um, the domestic first responder resources and how it all gelled together in, in a way that was, you know, it was mind boggling for me. And then I wanted to be part of it, you know, in, in whatever capacity. I think that, um, you know, and then like I said before, is just seeing the guys come in and in black and then rappelling down. That for me was just like, but yeah, I've seen it in, I've seen that shit in the movies. I was like, I want to, you know, I've seen that stuff now. Like, but that doesn't, you know, that's the inspiration. But to see it for real and then see how all the mechanics come in um, as, a, as a relatively young digger, you know, um, and someone coming into that environment, I think that that was really a special um, experience to be able to have on, on so many different levels, you know. So you had the Commonwealth Games in 2006 and then your first deployment to Afghanistan was in 2007 as an EW team leader on SOTG4. What mm-hmm. did what did this role entail and how many EW operators did you have in your team on your first deployment? Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I um, pretty much came off fresh fresh off the bat of, uh, of, of becoming qualified and we finished our reinforcement cycle so uh you know all of the all of our additional skills that we learn after being selected for further training were completed um you know uh, our insertion skills and, and and other skills like that um we you know your acqb all the all these skills we, we completed and then so i was pretty much it was, everything was fresh in the mind and uh the call came up yeah, you you know you're being attached to Alpha Company, and um, you're going to be the team leader. And you know, I, I, I kind of, I kind of like had this thing in my throat. I was really excited, um, but at the time, I'd only I'd only just been promoted from a digger to to a lance jack, lance corporal, and you know I thought, okay, I'm going to be the two I see here uh, because there was already um, a, a corporal. And, uh, and it was the first time actually since that with Alpha Company 
that a um, that they were deployed. Uh, there was a little bit of a hiatus in between the third rotation and rotation four, um, between when they got deployed again. So it was almost like a start stop and and really starting over from that point again, um, from where the first three rotations had been, and so because I've just been qualified, you know, uh, then they said, you're going to be the team leader. I said, what about, you know, old mate? And I won't say no, no, but what about old mate? You know, he's, he's the corporal. And I said, well, you know, you've earned your spot, mate. You, you, you're qualified. Um, and we want you to be the team leader. And I was like, yep, I'll go. I'll do it. So I, that was really, that was, um, you know, uh, humbling for me to be selected and then actually go, well, look, I'm, I'm going to have be punching above my rank and, and what we were talking about earlier on in, in before the call is going off oh, wow. now I've got I've got like a team of dudes to you know also be mindful of as the team leader and that additional responsibility now for that and then to do our job for the for the company. So um yeah that that was how how I got over to you know as a team leader to um on, on our first trip. So how did you cope with the added responsibilities of the role during this time? Yeah, I think I was, it was mixed feelings, really, um, because I was, you know, as, as, a, as a junior leader, um, uh, I, I, I had these sort of things, and you know, the, the, the little chirp on the back of my mind. I'm like, oh, I need to be able to keep up. I'm still, I'm fresh here, you know. I've, I've just, I've got all these skills now and I've just finished these skills, but now I'm actually being asked to to perform my role that I've been trained to do for so long now and it's game time and uh you know all those little thoughts of am I going to live up to that experience from a professional role uh mindset uh from that lens is like am I going to perform you know I've got dudes to be able to do you know how am I going to um do this uh you know how well oh you know the the reservations of wanting to perform and and those little things were in the back of my mind you know the all the little what ifs i knew that i was capable of being able to do my role fantastically i love that job it was an amazing job and and then i love doing the the shooter stuff as well so that was really exciting but i think all those little bits and pieces you know going well this it's been a little while so what again i look to uh you know the, the guys, my peers that had been on the rotation beforehand and he gave me some really great guidance as to what to be expected and then what was expected of, of, of me and, and the team. Uh, well, he, was, he was the only one at the time, so I had a team of two others. So, like, our team was only a small, what they call a force-multiplying attachment team to that capability, to the, uh, the ISR capability, um, intelligence and snipers and recon. So that that capability, uh, we brought something to the party. So I think it was really, you know, the, uh, all those little things, how are we going to do this and when we can get there? And you can't really, you can think about it in your head um, about what might happen until you're on the ground and then it's not until you're on the ground and you're, you're doing it that you also develop some, some of the other trade crafts and trade secrets that you, um, you know, that, that help you do what you do. So I think, you know, that was, uh, that was the exciting one, scary bit at the same time of, of that, you know, I was only a team leader, but that, that added responsibility, I think that that's the thing that I was really sort of uh, worried about at the start. But once you get there, all those things, I think it's, if you don't, if you don't have those little bits of worries in the back of your head or you haven't given them a thought, there's something to worry about because once you actually, you know, it's like going out, um, you know, like a DJ now, if you're performing and you go, oh, I've got the butterflies, you know, but once you, once you, it's game time, boom, everything kicks in, your training kicks in uh, and, and, and all that rolls on and that's what you train for because that muscle memory just happens. It was it was something we actually spoke about earlier before the before the podcast, mate. Where you know I've I've had a similar experience myself, being a you know being a crew leader and a deputy captain in the RFS. You know, it's it's stepping up to the role of you know being a crew leader. It's something that it's it's hard at first, Andy. Like you <laughs> you know, and you've always you've always got the thing in the back of your mind of you know like if I fuck this up, <laughs> I 
I, it's it's not only going to hurt me, but it's going to hurt my team and and my yeah. you know the people that I'm you know that I'm in charge of and leading and you know it's it's and we've got to say well I've my captain has said to me and and I and I believe this fear is a good thing fear is if you don't have fear on a fire ground you shouldn't be on a fire ground because it fear is good because it, it means you're actually thinking of the what ifs you know what like you like you just said you know the what ifs you know all the little things all the you know but it's once your game time, you know, the butter and every time I go out, mate, I've I've got butterflies and my tongue, my stomach is turning and because I'm always thinking of the what ifs. But when I get out there, I start to relax and 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 it's game time, you know, you get in and you like you exactly what you're saying, you know, you you do your muscle memory, your training, and that's why we train, yeah. you know, and, and it all comes back to you. And it's a anyone, any young person that is, you know, that listens to this take it away Andy that you know that's why you do your training you train for these things absolutely and I think also that mindset as well once you once I was on the ground um the the beauty about being in in in, in that special forces environment is that the leadership uh, and being a sub SME or a subject matter expert is that the le- the leadership looks you know has places a big emphasis on it it's junior leaders, you know, to be the subject matter expert and really still you, you, you get a say, you have a voice and, and your, um, your role's respected in, in that way because you had subject matter in, in that field. So I think when uh, that, that just blew me away, you know what I mean, is if in, in comparison to the, the regular army um, where th- th- there might have be instances, but in my experience that I, that I observed and, and lived at that time was like, okay, now I'm being asked to provide a high level brief to you know to whoever, whoever it is, whether it's in the um, the you know the orders group or if it's there on the ground at the time, people are listening to what our reporting is for my particular role because that's what I knew, and I think that was just amazing. Um, and then as a junior leader as well, it just blew me away that I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, it gives you that extra confidence to know that what you're doing, if you know your stuff and you you earn that place that you've um, you, you've secured it when you're when you're on the ground. Absolutely. And so what were your first impressions of Afghanistan, the country and the people when you first got there in 2007? Yeah, uh, we because there'd been uh, a, a, quite a, a gap between rotation three and rotation four, um, when we rocked up, we were actually, we, we deployed a small contingent of us deployed early with, uh, with, a, with a lot of a few of the assets to be able to, to set up shop. So all like some key stakeholders in, in key roles went early and deployed um, forward of the, the, the main body. And so we were there for, for some time, some weeks, you know, I forget the exact amount, of, but like quite a fair while setting everything up, making sure all the things were in checks were in place and all the stuff was there ready for when the boys come. Boom, it was straight into, you know, uh, straight into the into war fighting, basically. So um, my first expectations, we were um, in the C-17 and it was a, a long, big-ass flight, but the, 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 the plane that we were on, if I can describe the C-17, there was just all this gear in the middle. And there was, a, you know, a, a few of us who were, who were rolling up in the plane and you know, the guy's giving us food and it was a long, big-ass flight in those uncomfortable bloody netting chairs or things that they might call chairs but you know we, we just ended up sleeping in the back of some of the vehicles and setting up little yeah but it, that was a good flight but I could just remember coming over the hill and and and, and the, the C-17 sort of did a pass over Tarankaut and then rocked around near the near the airfield and um because I could you could see out the window it was a clear day it was summer for that rotation in the summer and but I, I didn't know what the, the heat was going to be like at that time and I just remember seeing the the you know the, the mountains and then I could see the the snow the snow caps and then as we this is for real and then the, that sort of for real um it was almost surreal because as the the ramp came down it was just like quiet we were there first and it was I think it must have been a little bit of a transition period so Hot day, middle of the day, rammed down, blast to the face, hot, dry air, bloody 45 degrees or, or whatever it was. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is really quiet. And um, 
I just remember, uh, you know, the guy that was coming to greet us, the greeting party said, well, enjoy this, boys, because this is the quietest it's going to be, you know. So here we, are, here we are just like thinking it's going to be, okay, just game on straight away because, you know, the heart was pumping that we're actually landing in theatre and all this training and all, all the work up was just starting, you know, that was day one. But then it was just for that moment that when the ram went down, it was kind of, oh, this is, you know. So from that point for that first couple of weeks or that time of the build-up that we were there, it was almost surreal because that, like I remember what the, what the, the greeting guys said, said, this is going to be the quietest that you're going to be. And then from that point on when the boys arrived, it was like, yeah, we spent all of our time outside of the wire uh, and, and warfighting. So um, that's that was the that first impression of Afghanistan. You know, I was thinking, well, this is a little bit quiet and then it got really noisy. But at the same time, I could see that there was beauty in the place, um, looking at the big, massive hills and then, you know, coming over some green belts. And, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful spot. If only they could get their shit together. You know, um, but you know the, the country and the, the 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 backdrops are just stunning when you're looking at the the sheer scale of, of of where you are. You know, I think that that's that that juxtaposition of actually going, well, we're here to actually war fight, but look, that's bloody beautiful. You know, I'll take a snap of that. Yeah. So, what was your interaction with the locals like? Was it were they friendly towards you, or was it a little bit hostile? It depended on on where we were, Adam, um, and, and what we were doing. So, some villages you'd see the stink eye straight away, and then you'd see, and some villages did see that there was a more a friendly tone to it, especially with the kids that you'd go in here because you know at at that time we were predominantly vehicle mounted, so we had them. Um, large footprint of heavily tooled up vehicles, you know, with the SRVs and we there was a lot of firepower, man. And and when we were going through, if they were sympathetic to the coalition, or well, uh, you could see. But if not, it'd be there yet. You're at the ready. But you always had to be at the ready. But you could see if, if there's kids running around uh and, and a few other key indicators that it'd be more friendly towards what you're doing. And then not and you know that would that that um, landscape changed on the second tour, but from that first tour, I think that that's that was a big that was a big thing. Um, as far as being able to work with, I had an interpreter latched to me, so we trained them up, and they were um, you know uh, American uh, citizens or first generation citizens, or you know because the job that that we had required a clearance. So to have someone there be able to speak the language and as well as have done some of the training, you could sort of see where it was. But, you know, we actually had the, you know, got to work with the Afghan National Army guys as well from that early point. So, you know, as that relationship grew from that early set, you know, it was the first time we'd been there. So obviously it hadn't worn on for a while and, and people hadn't become complacent or however things end up being down the track. But at that point in time, you know, everything was fresh. There was people wanting to work with us. Um, you know, the a a guys were diligent. Um, and, and so we had that opportunity to be able to really um, build, uh, build a rapport off the bat, you know, at that, at that particular point in time. So, you know, from, working with people and attachments to the local people. Um, yeah, there was, you could tell if they were happy to see you or not. <laughs> so can you share with us some of your more memorable moments on your first deployment? Yeah, uh, oh, I remember we were talking about, you know, some of the people that you really respect. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about just the, like, you know, the war stories. I mean, that, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit, but um some of the memorable moments are the stuff that happens behind the scenes that people don't get a glimpse into. You know, um, there'd be there'd be times where with the with the CSM, his name was Rufus, right? And uh, as a small team our, and our call sign, you know, he didn't know who I was. He knew I was qualified, but you know, he needed to find out because he, he wasn't like more of an old school like, infantry bloke. To uh, I needed to. I needed to earn his trust or he was testing me to see if, if he could actually trust me because, uh, you know, and I remember that he was just, just 
he'd be taunting me at these different points in time. And I'm just thinking, does he like me? And then it was just playing in my head. You know, this is when in that in those few weeks when before the main body came there, I'm like, is this dude like, is he just fucking with me? Or is he like, you know, he was really, he'd make me really feel like really aggressive, but only just being really recently qualified in, in, in the command. I'm like, okay, well, I haven't really had this before. And it got to the point, you know, from compared to the uh, the regular army. And I remember, um, you know, he, he, this had went on for some time and we're packing the vehicles and getting, doing some battle prep, um, ready for the guys to arrive and then starting to get our first job happening. And long story short, as this had continued on, is this guy fucking bastardizing me or something? Oh, does he like me? And, and all these things. And then in the end, there was one point where he was just egging and egging one day. And, I, and in the end, you know, um, I, I, said, I snapped and was like, oh, fuck off, Rufus, mate. You know, this, I'm doing bloody doing this is what we're doing. And then he was like, yeah, I could see that you got some gun and, and some gun to that, you mate. You know, and he, he, that was like a test that he was doing just to see if I would actually back down. Um, because you're in an environment of alpha males. And, and that was a point then uh, where a memorable point where I knew that I'd kind of earned his respect and he'd sort of go, and I'd prove to him that he could trust me because there was points during the tour where we were under some heavy fire. You know, we were in troops in contact. We were bloody, you know, some, some uh, heavy gun battles. And he was there and it was like our call sign. So we had, uh, you know, uh, Major Langford at the time and, and that calls and some key um, roles within that call sign, um, you know, and Rufus and, and some other, other uh, attachments war fighting together. And, and that was a point there where he could knew that, you know, if you had to rely on, on someone, you, you know, or, or earn that respect, that was a point, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, the, the dog bites back he's not a, he's not he's not a pussy type thing and and that's uh, i suppose in that mentality there um something that was you know i, I didn't see it as a bad thing i'm like okay yeah i, I see now why he did that you know it, yeah, can i trust this dude um and that, that was one point but then there was times when we we're inside the wire and i i remember on, on, on both both tours uh you know um cam Baird, you know vc yeah lest we forget um he was he was a he was, I think, a, a 2IC on, on, on the first trip with Alpha. And uh, I knew that he liked playing the guitar. And, and there was only, you know, yeah, the guitar over there. And loved listening to playing, like, Kiss, you know. Or, you know <laughs> Kiss was one of his favourite bands. And I remember, oh, yeah, how do I get to know some of the, some of the other shooters? And, oh, yeah, did you play guitar, mate? And, you know, um, really friendly dude. And you just go in and start jamming. So every now and then... You know, when there was some downtime, it's those jamming moments in the background where you've got these, you know, alpha male, elite special forces soldiers, and in your downtime, you're just normal blokes as well. And you get up to larrikins. And, and, you know, I just remember that music for, for that bloke was a, as an outlet and, and I got to be able to connect. And then now I just look back on that time and go, wow, that's a really special moment um, with, with someone who was uh, so high, ended up being so highly decorated and had, had their own amazing um, career and achievements. Um, and I got to be able to, to do it, like, you know, jam on, on operations, you know, in some downtime. Um, but then to, a, a, you know, being in, 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 in battle, and, and being in gunfights and just, you know, with all of our training and, and how all the mechanics worked and, and when you actually took a step back and there wasn't really that many moments like to take a breather, but you'd see everything working and, and, and how everything worked from a professional point of view, that was just mind-blowing to go, yeah, I'm a part of this. You know, we're, we're banging in and or, you know, we'd go through uh, one village where there was one particular um, battle that we had and, and you know it was a you'd we'd go through the whole, whole village and it was yeah all the uh, everything that we'd been taught and, and gone through we were just going and clearing and firing and moving and everything was happening there we had overwatch coming in and providing us cover well it was just you know um and the oc was on the it was just just really 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 cool to be um to be doing them, to be war fighting. You know, that's what we trained for. And I mean, yes, it's scary and all those other things that sort of result from it, but from a, a memorable point of view, like there's there's there's, there's many like that um, points, but, you know, uh, as highlights, that was amazing. And I suppose 
to see what the uh, the last one imparting from from some of those other uh, it was to see how when we had a you know a, a, a casualty um, it's just seeing how the reaction and the resources that came in for that casualty came in with the medivac you know talking from a looking uh, from the outside and going okay this is what happens when someone actually does get hurt um, and these are the resources that we can come and bring to bear and just seeing that professionalism of those guys coming out to do that and then to extract um, this particular um, you know soldier that, that got extracted and was wounded was just a, amazing as well from that tour and, and you know that just really cemented in my mind yes yeah you can you can train and and you can get to a certain level but until you're you're on operations um, and on a two-way range. Um, that's when it's all real and it comes in and you've got to bring your your game face every day when you're out there. What was it like for you after your first deployment? Was it what you expected and was it how you expected you perform? How was your overall assessment of your performance? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that, that first deployment, because that was, it was the first one, there was a lot of, of, of firsts obviously and um but the experience that i had with the you know professionally and and and, and, and working with some amazing people and uh, you know in the leadership i couldn't have asked for a better deployment on in, in that you know when i went over on sotg4 it was a tight tight company um all, all the dudes that i worked with were just amazing and and the leadership brought the best out in in me and then so I can perform my duties um, to the best of my abilities. And, you know, I've mentioned, uh, you know, the, in Langford before, you know, uh, uh, Brigadier General now, um, the way that he brought the whole company together and then all the other leaders, like it, because it, it comes from the, you know, the team leaders all the way up. But I just, uh, yeah, I don't want to name, name names or anything like that. So, um, but from that viewpoint, it was just, Amazing. Uh, and uh, I think that that set the tone for what was going to, you know, as I couldn't have asked for a deployment. Yeah, obviously, there were some casualties, but um, we came home safe. And there were some traumatic incidences um, as, as part of that deployment. But I think overall, um, in terms of what I expected from being in a, a deployed role and, and doing my, my job um, and being a team leader, yeah, I, I, I can't ask for a, a better example, you know, from my experience anyway. So in in 2008, you received a Special Forces commendation from Major General Hindmarsh. Could you explain to us what a Special Forces commendation is and what was Major General Hindmarsh's role and what does what does this honour for the work on that deployment mean to you? Okay, so yeah, so, so Major Major General uh, Mikhail Marsh, he was the he was commander of so Special Operations Command. So he was the overall commander of of uh, all, all the all the elements that that formed that group uh, within the, the Australian Special Forces. So uh, he was he was the main man and to to be able to award that. And the Special Forces Commendation was to be able to recognise uh, exemplary performance um, for, for, the, for the individual um, and, you know, in, in support of, of uh, a force element. So in this case, in my role as a team leader, EW, uh, providing support for the Alpha Company at the time. And so it really meant a lot that uh, the, the, the people that, that nominated me uh, that thought that I provided a job that was noteworthy. And I was, uh, it was just a, it was the, the cream on top when I found out, like I didn't know about it until a knock off one day and, and the firms are being awarded this, my like, you know, um, and, and I was gobsmacked at the time, you know, in my, I'd suppose that, um, I was so shocked that uh, uh, nothing really came out of my mouth, you know, and I was like, oh, they're going to say something like that, well, you know. So if I had my time again, I'd actually re-say, re you know, thank you to all the uh, amazing uh, people that I had the opportunity to work with and for that leadership that I had that brought the best out of me so that I could actually do my job to the best of my abilities. And uh, I, I really am humbled to have been, um, you know, uh, uh, awarded that comment 
foundation and because it means it means a lot you know I, I, I love that job and to have that validation to have done that in, in um, you know in, in war fighting conditions I think you know I, I can't couldn't have asked for more um, you know obviously there's other uh, other awards for valor but in terms of being able to perform uh, my job and, and what that's what the commendation is for um, I think you know that was really uh, really um, a, a pinnacle and a highlight to have been uh, awarded it Absolutely, mate, and it's something that you know you should be very proud of. It, and I can see, mate, you're very humble and and you're very you're honoured in in receiving that. And well done, mate. You you deserve that, and well done. Thank you. So you come back from Afghanistan, and how did you go adjusting back into normal life, being back in Australia after your first deployment? Uh, after the first deployment, yeah. So we uh, when I got back to Australia, there was a, there was a few other things that were going on. So basically. Basically, there was one module that was uh, that we because we had the call up to, to be deployed that still needed to be completed. Um, so basically, I came from deployment, and then we all banged on to that. And we thought we were like you know being you know shafted the, the you know the the, the point you we know, were being shafted and um, before we got to go and leave. And uh, but we we finished that course, and then there was a couple of other little things before we got on leave. So I suppose in, in that sense, from that first deployment, it was uh, a focus on being able to, to, to just keep rolling on with the next job, you know. Yeah, that's done. That's hooked in. But I think the adjustment really came when uh, I went on leave and it was around about Christmas time there. So, you know, I, my my girlfriend at the time, um, I was she thought I was just shirking her off and, and going, you know, this is what's happening. But that's what was happening. I had to go to work. And you know, she was under this impression at the time that you know I, I wasn't I was there in Kiril leave and so relationships that particular relationship there you know my was it, it was it was a you know, kind of all unravelled with everything that was going on and um, you know knowing that I was going to be going uh, I thought it was Christmas time and I thought well that relationship's kind of done I just need to decompress now so I just booked a ticket. To um to go to Europe, you know, to Euro Pass. I had some friends that were doing the, you know, uh, Ibiza and Kitzbühel, which is like in Austria. So they'd go and work the summer and then work the winter, and then they were living the life. So what my point is that Christmas, I'd go to certain destinations and meet up with different friends there to decompress, and then I'd do my own stuff, and then I'd meet up with, with different crew um, around Europe. So that was oh, I think about six or seven weeks that I. I pretty much spent like all my leave over there and I came back the day before type thing. But at the same time, because I went straight on to uh, like my, uh, one of these other modules and completed that before I went on leave, I was still at a heightened level of, of, of awareness. So I hadn't had time to decompress really. So I think what I noticed is I was a lot more on edge because I was, I'd gone from this war fighting environment and then I went to go to Europe where there's heaps more people. And, you know, um, that didn't really vote well with me because I was on such a high level and I had such an expectation of different people. Throughout the time while I was there, um, I managed to start rolling off a bit. But there was, yeah, there was times there I was like, you know, sort of peeking out a little bit and or getting really anxious because there was so much crowds and, and noises. I didn't really know at the time um, that that was a bit of a precursor. But then, you know, as well as the stupid amount of drinking and, 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 and partying that was going on. It was, yeah, that was all part of being able to adjust, but I think also it might've been in a little bit of excess um, just coming off it to try and sort of not have to deal with what I'd just been through. You know? Absolutely. And I was just about to say that was there, was that the early signs for you that there was potential of a PTSD from that first tour or was that later on? I think there was probably some, some early signs there, a little of uh, excess of alcoholism and, and also, um, you know, some of the symptoms of, of, of PTSD, the anxiety and being hyper vigilant um, and being probably overly a little bit overly aggressive as well. Like, so, you know, we're trained to be able to have the escalation of force, but being overly aggressive to some certain situations, um, you know, 
I remember there was one time in, in Paris and France and, and we were, I was flashing around the cash a little bit in some of the places. So people kind of latch on, all these backpackers kind of latch on. And, and we ended up getting into to this fight because these guys were trying to pick up these, um, these, these women that we were with at the time. And anyway, I kind of just went in hammer and tongs straight away because the guy was in my face expecting that I'd have these oppos that, you know, my, uh, my, my commando brothers to come in and, you know, boom, bang in. In, but these guys held back and like, well, I'm by myself, man. I'm trying to fight seven dudes. You know, what do you think is going to happen? So, um, you know, and then afterwards, I, I've held my own a little bit, but I still received quite the beating. And then afterwards, they're like, that was cool, man. I'm like, fuck off, you can't. Yeah, well, sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, so, and so I, um, yes, got myself into probably at times because of my, uh, you know, I was, I was quite short fused. I was exposing myself a little bit more to being able to, you know, fr- from other things. And, and that's the early onset of, uh, of, 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 you know, with, with PTSD and, and some of the symptoms that are involved. So um, I think, yes, to answer that, yes. Um, looking back at it now, I don't really, I haven't really shared that, um, you know. So thanks for asking that question. And if someone, you know, um, can relate to that, then, yeah. I thought it was a, a good question to ask, Andy, because it, it made, like, looking back now and, you know, like many years on from, you know, when you've, you know, you've had time to now decompress through both your tours and, you know, what, you, what you've gone through. And, and it, I feel it's, a, it's an important, you know, because like you said and like the podcast is, there could be other diggers out there that are, you know, that have had or ex- still experiencing similar circumstances today and you talking about it going, oh, actually, hey, I've had that experience, you know. I've, I've, I've yeah. t- decided to take the risk and you know and start taking the risky behavior and and jumping in and you know not taking that step back and going hang on if if i was actually fully there i i wouldn't have you know i wouldn't have jumped into that situation with seven guys and you know and going hey back me up which i kind of I, I can see it andy like i can see with i can see with mates you know we, we all think well come on our mates are with us like you know and and it's the it's the code you know like you yeah. andy it's the code you you've got mates that you know if 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 you and i get you know if i'm out with you drinking or you know and something happens and i'm not condoning violence at all but i'm saying you know if something was to happen you back your mate up that's that's what you do you you yeah. know but but at that stage you hadn't realized that oh something was amiss and you know you you were still heightened from what had happened yeah yeah and my my expectation was that here but then you know i think the the, the severe expectation that i was here um as what was expected and, and it took me a long time to realize that and adjust in particularly after you know after discharging from the military like you you kind of had that expectation and and, and they're the things that you go well, what make people miss the, the military even more or, or that sense of belonging anyway and purpose. That was part one of a two-part episode with former second commando Andy Fermo. Join us in a fortnight's time for part two. Thanks for listening.